Hi, and welcome to our talk. My name is Guillaume Fournier. I'm a security engineer at Datalog. And today, Sylvain Afshan and I are going to present the rootkits that we implemented using eBPF. If you don't know what eBPF is, don't worry. We are going to present this technology and tell you everything you need to know in order to understand the talk. So let's start with a few words about us. We are the cloud workload security team. We usually use eBPF for good. And our goal is to detect threats at runtime. Everything we do is added to the Datadog agent, which is an open source project. So feel free to check it out if you are interested. That being said, for DEF CON, we decided to use everything we knew about eBPF to build the ultimate rootkit. So as I said before, we are going to start the talk with a brief introduction to eBPF. Then Sylvain will take it over to talk about how we implemented obfuscation and persistent access in our rootkit. After that, I will come back to present the command and control feature um, along with some data exfiltration examples. And then I will talk about the network discovery and RASP bypass features of the rootkit. And finally, Sylvain will present the, a few detection and mitigation strategies that you can follow to detect rootkits such as ours. All right, so let's start with eBPF. eBPF stands for um, Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. It is a set of technologies that can run sandboxed programs in the Linux kernel without changing the kernel source code or having to load kernel modules. It was initially designed for um, network packet processing, but many new use cases were progressively added. So for example, you can now use eBPF to do kernel performance tracing um, along with network security and you know, runtime security in general. So how does it work? So eBPF is simply a two-step process. First, you have to load your eBPF programs in the Linux kernel, and then you need to tell the kernel how to trigger your programs. So let's have a look at the first step. Um, eBPF programs are written in C. So it's not exactly C, it's more like a subset of C because of many restrictions that eBPF has to follow. But I'm gonna talk about this later. So once um, you have your C program, uh, you can use LLVM to generate eBPF bytecode, um, which you can then load into the kernel using the BPF syscall. eBPF programs are really made of two different things, eBPF maps and the actual program. So there are a lot of different types of eBPF maps, but all you need to know is that they are the only way to persist data um, generated by your eBPF programs. Similarly, there are a lot of different program types and each program type has its own use case. Um, however, regardless of the program type, each program has to go through the same um, following two phases. So the first one is the verifier step. So we'll talk about this later, but for now, um, just know that this ensures that your program is valid. And second, you have the, um, I mean, second, your eBPF bytecode will be converted into machine code by a just-in-time compiler. And when those two phases succeed, your program is ready, ready to be executed. Step two is attaching VPF programs. So in other words, this is when you tell um, the kernel how to trigger your program. So there are many different program types and I can't present them all, but I'm just going to talk about four of them. So for example, um, you, have, um, you can use a K-probe to trigger an eBPF program whenever a specific symbol in the kernel is called. Trace points are similar to K-probes, but the hook points on which they can be attached have to be declared manually by the kernel developers. Those two programs require another syscall um, in order to, um, you know, to be attached. And this syscall is the perf event open syscall. So the other two program types I wanted to talk about are TC classifiers, so it's SCAD CLS, and XDP programs. So those program types are, um, can be used to do packet processing. Um, so whenever some you know, you know, network traffic is detected at the host level or at the specific network interface level. Those two um, require a netlib command to be attached. And the only thing to remember here is that each program type has its own setup and thus might require a different level of access. Another very important fact about eBPF is that eBPF maps can be shared between different programs regardless of their program types. All right, so the eBPF verifier. Um, so the verifier is, um, is used to ensure that eBPF programs will finish and won't crash. Uh, to do so, it's really just you know, a list um, of rules that the, the verifier checks and your program has to comply with those rules. So for example, uh, your program has to finish. It cannot be you know, like an infinite loop. Uh, 
So you, your program has to be a directed uh, acyclic graph. Um, you can have unreachable code, you can have unchecked dereferences, um, your stack size is limited and your overall program size is also limited. And finally, one of the most infamous features of the verifier is its very cryptic outputs. Um, so basically, if your program doesn't pass the verifier step, you will have a huge log of uh, everything that the verifier looked into and eventually some kind of you know, error telling you what happened. But um, yeah, basically you are in for a very painful debugging session. Last but not least, eBPF comes with a list of helpers that will help you access data or execute operations that you wouldn't be able to write natively. Um, so for example, you have context helpers, you have map helpers, um, a lot of things that you wouldn't be able to write in C and that you would need external uh, you know, instrumentation to, uh, to do. In short, you have about 160 helpers and most of the heavy lifting of your eBPF programs will be based on those, those helpers. So that concludes this introduction to eBPF and I will hand it over to you, Sylvain, so that you can kick off the presentation of the road kits. Thank you, Guillaume. Before we get into the details, let's see why eBPF is an interesting technology to write a road kit. First, the safety guarantee brought by eBPF means that a bug in our road kit cannot crash the host. An error in the execution will not cause any log message to be emitted. The user therefore has no way to know that something actually went wrong and notice, notice the presence of the rootkit. As we saw earlier, the BPF byte code is converted to native code and the number of instructions is limited, which limits by extension the performance impact that our rootkit can have on the machine that could otherwise be detected by the user. On the commercial side, eBPF is used by an increasing number of vendors in various use cases, network monitoring, security for instance. With eBPF becoming widespread, the chance of one product being abused to load malicious programs also increases. The safety guarantee we just talked about should not give the security administrators a false feeling of security. There is a lot of activity around eBPF and each new version of the Linux kernel comes with a new set of eBPF helpers, bringing new capabilities. As we wanted our rootkit to run on widely used distribution, or li distribution Linux such as Red Hat Enterprise Linux or the latest Ubuntu LTS, we used a limited number of helpers. Using recent helpers or features like KRSI would have probably made the development of the rootkit easier. One of the primary tasks of a rootkit is to hide itself. What does it mean in our case? eBPF programs are bound to a running process. If this process gets killed, all the attached eBPF programs will be unloaded. For that reason, it is essential that we both hide our program and protect it from being killed. The eBPF programs and maps used by the rootkit should also be hidden, and we should forbid other programs to gain access to them through their file descriptors. So let's see our rootkit in action. So let's start the rootkit which gives us its PID. Then we can try a ps command in order to see if we can detect it from the output. We can try using its procfs entry and nothing. Uh, we can even try using a, a sub file uh, or even a relative pass. And we still have the same issue, no such file or directory. And finally, we can try to send a signal uh, to see what happened, and we get a uh, no such process error. The obfuscation capabilities of our rootkit mainly rely on the use of two BPF helpers. The BPF ProWrite user helper allows our BPF program to write into memory of the process that issues a syscall. This can be used, for instance, to alter the data that is returned by a syscall. It's also possible to alter the syscall arguments. There is one caveat with this helper. The memory to be modified has to be mapped into the kernel address space. Otherwise, a minor or major pitch fault will be triggered, causing the BPF property user call to fail. The other BPF helper is to eat the BPF override return. This one allows you to change the return value of a syscall and has an interesting property. 
If the ECL helper is used at the syscall exit, it will simply change the return value of the executed syscall. But if we use it at the entry of the syscall, the execution of the syscall will be completely skipped. It is important to note that this helper can only be used at the entry of the syscall or at the exit. So let's see how the obfuscation of a file actually works. At startup, the wikit will populate a map with the path of its pre proc PID folder. Now the user space issues a file related syscall, such as, such as state. These syscalls usually come in two forms. One that accepts pa the path to the file as a string, another one that accepts a file descriptor for the file that the user space program must have previously retrieved using an open syscall. So let's consider the former. To properly identify the targeted file, the rootkit needs to do an accurate resolution of the path, as the path specified could be a relative path. At the entry of the syscall, there is not enough context to do, the, to do the resolution. So we need to hook deeper in the kernel, in our case, in DBFS code. So we have the resolution, but at this point, we cannot block the syscall, as we are outside of the allowed hook points for the eBPF override written helper. So the only thing that we can do is to change the return value so that the user space believes that the syscall failed. We also need to scrap the content of the structure that could have been filled by the, by the kernel. Now let's consider the later, the version that accepts the file descriptor. We do the same pass resolution as before, but instead of just pretending to the user space that the syscall failed, we store the file descriptor that the kernel allocated into an ABPF map. If the same processes issue the syscall with the same file descriptor, we can, at the syscall entry, return an error and block the syscall. In this situation, the user has no way to know that the file descriptor exists, and as we control the read the syscall, we can also add all the references to the file descriptor in procfs. Blocking the syscall that accepts the PID as an argument is trivial using BPF override return, same for loading kernel modules. Now let's see a demo. Uh, let, let's demo the obfuscation of our BPF programs and maps. So we still have the rootkit started. And if we list the maps and the programs thanks to the BPF tool command line, we can't see anything related to the rootkit. Now if we start a binary loading some k-probes and maps and we list again the programs, we can see the programs related to the binary, but still nothing related to the rootkit. Then we can even try checking the k-probes and still nothing related to the rootkit. The idea is to hook into the ABPF syscall itself. Two things are required here. We want to avoid the user space to iterate through the IDs of our entities using the BPF proc get next ID command, and we need to prevent the user space from getting a file descriptor to the program or map from the ID using BPF proc get FD by ID, basically to prevent ID guessing. Once these operations are handled by the rootkit, the user space is not able to view or modify our programs and maps. BPF Pro Write User is a crucial part in, of our rootkit, but it comes with a pitfall. When an eBPF program that makes use of it is loaded, the kernel prints a pretty scary but legitimate message in, in the kernel ring buffer. So let's see how the, the rootkit handles this. First, let's check what is the current status of the kernel ring buffer using the command line dmessage. So nothing special here. And we can even start a cat on the device used by the ring buffer. Then we start the rootkit. So we can see that the, the cat terminated with a pretty legit uh, looking message. We can recheck uh, the kernel ring buffer thanks to the dmessage command line. And we can only see legit looking messages. But a bit more. And then we can stop the rootkit and we can run again the dmessage command line in order to see what was overridden by the rootkit. So let's see how it works. In this diagram, Ronald is waiting for a new message and is blocked on a read syscall. Two BPF programs are loaded sequentially by the rootkit. The first one 
which doesn't use eBPF Provide user, will hook on our ELSIS call and will make it return zero and will write a legit looking message. This will guarantee that the warning messages related to the BPF ProBright user won't be read. Then the second program using BPF ProBright user is loaded. At this point, the ReadSys call can be unblocked and we can override the content of the warning messages with legit looking messages. Another important task for the rootkit is to set up a persistent access across reboots, for instance. The rootkit can copy itself to a dedicated place and hide its binary file with the same mechanism that we already saw. For the persistent access to the system, we can use a generic method close to what we described in the obfuscation part. We can replace the content of some critical files read by the root demand, such as crond or even sshd. Let's see an example targeting sshd and using the read override approach. So the approach here is to, happen, is to happen an SSH key to the authorized key files. Only SSH should be impacted, meaning the file will remain the same for the user point of view. And we want to have it available through the command and controls. So let's see this in action. So let's check the authorized keys content first. So we can see that only one key is present. So let's start a connection and it seems that uh, a password is required. So now we are going to start the rootkit and we are going to specify that we want to inject an SSH key to the authorized keys file, but only for SSH. So we can try a connection again and it seems to be successful. And now we can check what is the content of the authorized key from the user point of view and nothing changed apparently. Persistent access to an application database can also be set up using another type of eBPF program, uProbes iBPF programs attached to user space function. In addition to being safer and easier to use than ptrace, they offer a valuable advantage. The kernel will automatically set up for us the hooks on every instance of the program. Let's see a uprop demonstration using Postgres SQL. So first, let's try to connect to Postgres SQL using the word bonsoir as password. This one seems to be the good one. Then trying hello, and this one is rejected. Now we start the rootkit, and we'll get the opposite result. Now the valid password is hello. So the idea here is to hook on the MD5 crypt verify function of a Postgres SQL that checks whether the user provided the right MD5 for its role, passwords, and the challenge sent by the server. Overwriting the expected hash contained in shadow pass with a known value makes the comparison succeed and give persistent access to the database to the attacker. Now I will hand over to Guillaume that will show you the command and control capabilities of the rootkit. Thank you, Sylvain. Let's talk about the command and control feature of the rootkit. So what exactly do we want to do? We want to be able to send commands to the rootkit to extract trade data and to get remote access to the infected hosts. Unfortunately, there are a few eBPF related challenges that we need to face in order to implement those features. First, you can't initiate a connection with eBPF. Second, you, need, you can't open a port. However, eBPF can hijack an existing connection. So in order to show up this feature, we have set up a very simple infrastructure on AWS. A web app was installed on an EC2 instance, and we used um, a classic load balancer to redirect HTTPS traffic to our instance over HTTP. In other words, the TLS termination is done at the load balancer level, um, and HTTPS requests are sent to our instance unencrypted. So our goal is to implement um, CNC by hijacking the network traffic to our web app. First, we need to figure out which eBPF program types we're going to use in order to implement this feature. Although eBPF provides a lot of options to choose from, um, we decided to go with two eBPF program types, XDP programs and TC classifier programs. So both um, those programs are usually used to do deep packet inspection use cases, um, 
And while XDP only works for ingress, TC works on both ingress and egress traffic. Another difference between the two program types is that XDP programs can be offloaded to the network interface controller, which essentially means that your program um, will be run before the packet enters any subsystem into the network stack. On the other hand, TC programs have to be attached to um, and, uh, to, to a network interface, but like much later in the network stack, uh, which means that they are triggered later in the uh, kernel. Um, with both programs, you can drop, allow, and modify your packets. And with an XDP program, you can also retransmit a packet. Uh, this option is actually super interesting for us because it means that you can, um, you can essentially receive an answer to a packet even before it reaches the network stack which in other words means that uh, you can do this even before it reaches any kind of network firewall or monitoring on the hosts. Um, skipping the network stack also explains why XDP programs are mainly used for DDoS mitigation and um, TC programs are usually used to monitor and secure uh, network access at the pod or container level. So what you need to remember about this slide is that first, XDP programs can be used to hide um, network traffic from the kernel entirely, and TC programs can be used to exfiltrate data um, on its way out. Okay, first, let's see how we used XDP programs to receive commands um, with the rootkit. So we implemented a client for the rootkit, and this client communicates with the rootkit by sending simple HTTPS requests um, with a custom route um, and, and custom user agent. Um, so after going through the load balancer, um, the, the request eventually reaches the host and triggers our XDP programs. Then our program passes the request, the, the HTTP routes, and understand that this request is not meant for the web app, but is meant for us. So after sending the, after, sorry, after reading the user agent, um, the rootkit executes the requested command and moves on to the final step. So this final step is probably the most important one. Um, it overrides the entire request with a simple health check request. Um, and we do this for two different reasons. Uh, first, we don't want the malicious request to reach the web app um, or any kind of user space monitoring tool that might be uh, running and that might detect the unusual traffic. And second, we want the client to receive an answer in order to know if the request was successful. So as I said before, we could also have dropped the, the packet entirely, but since we're using TCP, the load balancer would have retransmitted the packet over and over again until the request times out. And this would have generated noise and increase our chances of getting discovered. That said, if you have, um, I mean, if you're working with a UDP server, this would be a, a totally valid, valid strategy. So let's have a look at how um, we can send Postgres credentials remotely. All right, so on the left of the screen, you can see two different shells. Those shells are connected to the remote infected hosts on AWS. And on the right, this is my local shell, and this is the attacker machine. Okay, so let's start with trying to log into the Postgres database uh, using the normal password. And again, the rootkit is not running yet. So as you can see, the bonsoir password um, works fine. And then let's start the rootkit and restart to log in again. And as expected, and as you've seen before during uh, uh, Sylvain's demo, um, it doesn't work. So you have to change into hello, and this time it will work. Here you go. Okay, so we're going to try to do the same thing, but instead of um, hard coding the new password with the rootkit, we're going to um, define remotely through CNC what the new password should be. So as you can see, um, we have a custom client that will make a request to HTTPS, um, an HTTPS request to defcon.demo.dog. And then uh, we will provide both the role and the secret to override uh, the, the normal secret wave. So the request that will go through is a very simple one with a custom route, and the user agent will contain the new password that will be used um, at runtime. So as expected, we get the 200 OK from the health check, which essentially means that we know uh, that the new password now is DEFCON and not uh, hello anymore. So as you can see, hello doesn't work, but if I change it to DEFCON, here we go, this time it does work. 
Okay, so this is how we send a command to the rootkit. Now let's see how we can exfiltrate data. So to exfiltrate data, the client has to send an initial request um, to specify what kind of data and what kind of resource we want to exfiltrate. So the XDP part of, uh, of this process is basically the same as before, but this time the XDP program stores the network flow that made the request along with the request resource, uh, the requested resource, sorry, in an eBPF map. And the reason why we do so is because um, when the web app answers the, the health check, we want to be able to detect the packets that are meant to be sent back to the client. So when the HTTP answers, answer reaches the um, TC egress classifier, our BPF program looks up the network flow and overrides the answer with the requested data. Now, the question is, what kind of data can you exfiltrate with the rootkit, right? And the answer is, well, pretty much anything that is accessible to eBPF. And the reason for that is, um, as I said before, multiple program types can share data through eBPF maps, regardless of uh, you know, what those programs are supposed to do. So basically, you can um, exfiltrate things like file content, environment variables, uh, database dumps, in-memory data, if you start looking at the stacks of the programs. Anyway, you can pretty much exfiltrate whatever you want. So let's have a look at um, a simple demo that is um, we can exfiltrate Postgres credentials along with the file content uh, of etc password D. All right, so and the, again, the two shells on the left are the ones connected to the um, infected hosts in, on AWS, and on the right, this is my local shell. So the first request that I make here is um, to list the, I mean, to do is progress list, which basically means plays list all the uh, credentials that you have detected so far since uh, the rootkit has started. And as you can see, the answer was, so the health check answer was overridden with uh, the content of a map that we use to store the, the passwords that we've collected at runtime. Um, and again, remember that with Postgres, you don't need the clear password to log in. You just need the hash password that is stored in the database. Here you go. So now we're going to try to do the same thing to dump the content of uh, ETC password D. So to do so, this is a two-step process. The first thing you want to do is tell the rootkit to start looking for um, this specific file. And as soon as a user space process tries to open the file and, and read the content of the file, our rootkit will actually copy the data as it is sent to the user space application and um, save it into the, an eBPF map so that it can be retrieved later. So this first request will tell the, 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 the rootkit to uh, start looking for etc password D. And now um, let's go back to the host and you know, do trigger some kind of pseudo um, operation so that uh, we can actually, I mean, so that a user space process tries to open the file. There you go. And then this time, instead of saying um, add, we're gonna say get, and this will dump the content of the etc password D file. Here you go. All right, so the cool thing about this technique is that it applies to any unencrypted uh, network protocol. So for example, we also implemented it for DNS, um, which means that you can actually use it to do DNS spoofing. Um, so the only difference between uh, the, the normal way of doing this and, and the DNS spoofing is that instead of using a TC uh, program to override the uh, answer, of the request, you, you will actually switch TC and XDP programs because um, DNS requests are made from the host instead of uh, received by the host. All right, so let's move on to our network discovery feature. So I know everybody knows what it is, but I have to say it anyway. Network discovery is the ability to discover machines and services on the network that, uh, so that you know where you want to go uh, next in the infrastructure. And also discovering services is a super important step uh, when you are trying to pivot um, between hosts because it will tell you what kind of attacks you might want to try. So the rootkit has two different network discovery features. Um, one of them is passive, the other one is active. And you can control both of them through uh, command and control. So I'm gonna get into more details later, but basically the only difference between the two is the kind of network scanning you're looking for and also the level of traffic that you are willing to generate on the network. So first, let's have a look at the passive 
um, option. So the passive option is simply a basic um, network monitoring tool. So it will do pretty much the same thing as any other uh, eBPF based network monitoring tool, which means that it will listen for any ingress or egress traffic and then generate a graph from all the collected network flows. Um, it will also show you the amount of data that's, that was sent uh, per network flow. And um, to implement this feature, we used our TC and XDP programs. So the TC programs were used to uh, monitor the egress traffic and the XDP programs were used to monitor the ingress traffic. So for this version of the rootkit, we are limited to IPv4 and um, TCP UDP packets. That said, uh, support for IPv6 and other protocols could have been added um, easily. So the reason why the passive option is pretty cool is that it will not generate any traffic um, on the network. In other words, it is basically impossible to detect that someone is tapping into uh, your network and more specifically the network that is, um, you know, with, that, that reaches the, this specific infected host. However, this doesn't work for services that uh, do not communicate with the infected hosts. And uh, so in other words, the graph will definitely not be complete. And that's also why we implemented the um, active method. So the active method is a simple ARP uh, scanner along with a SYN scanner. So we implemented it using only our XDP programs, which means that only, um, I mean, that the entire process is done um, without involving the, the kernel stack. And although this will be a slower process, you can use this method to discover hosts and services that are, that are reachable by the infected host, but that are not communicating usually with uh, the, the infected host. And again, the rootkit client will generate a nice, nice um, network graph for you uh, once the, the scan is complete. So on a technical level, this feature of the rootkit is actually quite interesting um, because as I said before, eBPF cannot create a connection from scratch. So in other words, we had to figure out a way to generate hundreds of SYN requests um, while dealing with this limitation of eBPF. So let's see how we solve this problem. So in order to send a SYN request, you first need to know the MAC address of the IP that you want to scan. Um, to do so, we use the, the same trick that we've been using so far, which is to override the request from the rootkit client. So when our XDP program receives a scan request um, for a specific IP in a specific port range, it will override the entire request with an ARP request for the target IP. And then instead of returning XDP pass, which is um, what we've done so far, and also which would send the packet to the network stack, our eBPF program returns XDP TX. So what XDP TX does is send the packet out to the network interface controller it came in from. Um, in other words, our HTTP packet was transformed into an ARP request and, sent, and, and was sent back to um, uh, and broke, broke, broadcasted back to uh, the entire local network. So eventually the uh, target IP will answer the ARP request and we will be able to store the MAC address of uh, this specific IP in an eBPF map. However, during this entire process, the TCP packet that was used to send the HTTP request was never acknowledged by the kernel. And, and that is simply because it never made its way to the kernel in the first place, which means that the load balancer or the client itself will eventually try to retransmit the packet. And when this packet is retransmitted um, and, and, we, and when it eventually reaches our uh, XDP program, we will do the exact same thing, but this time instead of, um, because we know the MAC address, instead of overriding the request with an ARP request, we're going to override the request with a SYN request. And more specifically, a SYN request with uh, the first port of the provided port range, the target IP, and, and the MAC address of the target IP. And assuming that the remote IP or the remote host doesn't have any kind of protection against uh, SYN requests, um, sorry, SYN scanning, it will answer either reset or SYN plus ACK to this first request. So reset would mean that the port is open and SYN plus ACK would, mean, would indicate that there might be a service running, running on the host. 
Um, and this is where the, the basically the, the network loop happens and the reason why we were able to uh, generate hundreds of um, packets without having to, uh, I mean, while dealing with the limitation of uh, eBPF, uh, that is the, um, the inability to uh, create packets. So whenever we get an answer from a scene request, we override the received packet with another scene request on the next port. And um, we also switch the IPs, switch the MAC addresses, and send it back again to the target IP. And we do so in a loop until the, um, we, we go through the entire port range. So eventually, the client uh, will try one last time to retransmit the, uh, the initial HTTP request. Um, because once again, uh, during the network loop, we never answered the uh, second retransmit. So eventually, um, when this third <laughs> retransmit reaches our XDP program, we will override the request with the usual um, you know, health check requests so that the, the a 200 OK answer will make its way back to the client after the request was handled by the web app in user space. All right, so let's see it in action. So on the right of the screen, this is a shell to the uh, infected host on AWS. And um, at the bottom here, it's another one. And at the top, this is um, my local shell uh, on my machine. So the first thing you want to do is to start the rootkit. Then second is to start dumping the logs of the rootkit. So in UBPF, you can actually generate logs using a trace pipe. Um, obviously, you would not want to do this uh, in a real use case for a rootkit, but this is a great way of visualizing um, the, the, the scan as it goes through. Um, yeah, so that's why I'm doing this, and that's why you will see what the rootkit does at runtime. And then let's make the uh, scan requests. So what I'm saying here is uh, please scan uh, the IP 10.0.2.3. Uh, from port 7990 and for the next 20 ports after this one. So the first thing you can see is the request is immediately changed into an ARP request and we already got the answer for this ARP request. So next up, when we get a retransmit, we will change this into a SYN request. Here you go, so the SYN request went through and then you can see the loop that happened and uh, we you know, like increased port one by one until we reached the final port um, requested by the, the port branch. And then now we are waiting for the third retransmit and this retransmit will be the one that we override with the health check request, which means that we will eventually get, here you go, the 200 OK and, and in other words, um, you know, the answer from the user space web app. All right, so now what you want to do is retrieve the, the, the output of the scan um, and exfiltrate the, all the network flows that were detected at runtime. And here you go. So you would say network discovery get, and eventually, um, so it, it actually requires a lot of different requests because there is a lot of data to exfiltrate, but eventually you will get the entire list of uh, network flows that were captured by, um, by the work kit. Here you go, so you have the, all the different um, individual flows. And then more importantly, you will have a graph generated for you. So this one is the uh, passive, sorry, active graph. So as you can see in a range there, you can see the ARP requests and replies from, uh, I mean, between those different hosts. And then in gray, um, those are the scene requests and the reset answers. And in red is the only sin plus ACK uh, answer from the remote host. All right, and then you have also the passive um, graph, which is the one that we saw before. Okay, so now let's move on to our RASP bypass. So RASP stands for Runtime Application Self-Protection. Um, so in a few words, a RASP is a new generation of security tools that uses um, runtime instrumentation to detect and block application level attacks. Um, and more importantly, it leverages its insight into the application in order to make more uh, intelligent decisions. So simply put, it is some kind of advanced input monitoring tool um, that can detect malicious parameters and can understand if a malicious input will successfully exploit a weakness um, from one of your apps. 
So the textbook example of a RASP is usually a SQL injection. So the RASP would um, implement multiple functions, uh, instruments, sorry, multiple functions um, in the libraries that you use, um, such as, for example, the HTTP server library or the SQL library. And it will check at runtime that the user controlled parameters in your queries are properly sanitized. Um, if not, the RASP will stop the query before it reaches the database and redirect the client to an error page or some kind of error message. In other words, a RASP um, relies on the assumption that the, the application runtime has not been compromised, which is exactly what we can do with eBPF. So just a little disclaimer before I move forward. Um, I want to stress the fact that we are playing outside of the boundaries of what a RASP can protect you from. Um, and more importantly, um, this bypass does not apply to one specific RASP, but to all of them, because this is one of the core principles of um, how a, a RASP works. So let's have a look at how a RASP protects um, a Go web app from a SQL injection. So let's say that you have a web app with a simple products page and a get parameter um, to specify the, the, the category of the products that you want to see. Chances are your web app uses the default Go database SQL interface. Um, so this is a generic interface that you can use to query a database without having to worry about the underlying driver and uh, the database type that you're using. More importantly for us, uh, since it is such a generic uh, interface, this is usually where the, the RASP tools um, instrument your code. Um, because simply it's much easier to hook at this layer uh, rather than having to hook onto all the underlying drivers. So when your request is handled by the web server, the query will be formatted with, um, with the, the provided category parameter and eventually the web app will call the query context uh, function of this SQL interface. Um, this is when the RASP uh, checks the, the, the query and makes sure that everything is normal. And if it is, the execution will resume its normal flow and the underlying query, um, driver will be uh, called. So in our example, we use SQLite, so the SQLite driver is called. Eventually, the query makes its way to the database and the answer is sent back to the client. However, if the RASP detects um, that uh, you know, something is wrong or detects some kind of SQL injection, it will block the query and redirect the client to um, an error page. All right, so now let's see what we did to bypass this protection. Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. We added a uprobe on both the uh, database SQL interface and the SQLite driver interface. Um, what this allows us to do is call one of our eBPF programs right before the RASP checks the SQL query and uh, trigger another one right before the, um, the, the SQL query is executed by uh, the database itself. And thanks to the BPF uh, ProBright user helper, um, we can override the input parameters of the hooked functions so that the, the RASP sees a benign query um, and the, the, the database executes our SQL injection. And the cool thing about this is that we can even do it uh, conditionally, um, which means that we can um, you know, bypass uh, the, the RASP only if one specific uh, secret password was uh, added to the beginning of the query. Perfect, so let's move on to the demo. Um, so as you can see, we have a very simple web app. Um, so it's a shoe re shoes retailer. Um, so you have a lot of different products and um, you can filter by category. So let's try to do a simple injection um, uh, using the get parameter. So the, the injection will simply be uh, union select star from user. Um, and because the RASP is not running right now, um, the SQL injection should work, here you go. And if you scroll down this time, you will see the users uh, along with the, the passwords. Perfect. So now let's restart the web app with the RASP, which is what I've just done, and try this again. So let's go to the shop and then override the um, category parameter. Perfect. And this time the RASP blocked the request because um, it detected that um, you know, someone tried to do a SQL injection and the SQL injection would actually have succeeded. 
Great, so now let's start the rootkit by providing the path to the web app and then try to refresh the page. So again, this should also be blocked by the rootkit, by the, the RASP, because we haven't provided the, the secret password for the bypass to work. And the secret password is, of course, DEFCON. And when we say DEFCON, the entire process that I described before will be triggered. And as you can see, the RASP did not detect it. So that's all for our RASP bypass. I hope you had fun. Um, just before I hand it over to Sylvain for the detection and mitigation strategies, I wanted to say that unfortunately we won't have time to talk about the container breakouts that are implemented into the rootkit. However, they have been presented during our Black Hat talk this year, so if you are interested, feel free to check it out. That being said, Sylvain, take it away. So let's talk about detection and mitigation. How could we detect and protect ourselves from this type of rootkit? We could do this at different levels. First, if a vendor provided you eBPF programs, you should go through an audit, an audit and an assessment phase of their programs. Some changes are that the code has to be GPL. It probably uses some internal kernel symbols, so you can ask for it. What should we be looking for? The program types that are used, but also the eBPF helpers used. The communication, so maps, between programs may indicate a potential risk in the case that the vendor program is compromised. We developed a tool to assist in this auditing phase. By inspecting the health files containing the eBPF programs, it is able to list the used entities, programs and maps, and compute a graph of the interactions between them. The tool was run on our rootkit with the following result. We can identify on the graph that the XDP program are storing information into maps that are also used by some K-probes, which correspond to the command and control capabilities of the rootkits. It is also possible to mitigate at runtime the loading of such programs by monitoring calls to the BPFC call and logging the usage of it. It will even be, it will even be possible to protect the BPFC call itself by either restricting the call to it to only some trusted processes, have the programs inspected before loading and rejected if they contain suspicious patterns or make use of some dangerous helpers. We could also compute and validate the signature of the programs before loading them. An initiative exists to add this verification logic to the kernel itself. Using TLS everywhere for network traffic also helps mitigating the risk of a rogue eBPF program that intercepts network data. Now, if we were not able to block the loading of such a rootkit, how difficult will it be to detect its presence? Even if it's possible, though very challenging, to write an almost perfect BPF rootkit, we should concentrate on the action that the rootkit will have to block and lie about the result of such actions. For instance, our rootkit disables the loading of the kernel modules because such a module will have the ability to list the eBPF programs and the active K probes. Now let's imagine that we insert a module that executes a specific action only known to us. The blocking of the module by the rootkit will then be easy to detect. Monitoring the network traffic, traffic at the infrastructure level could help detecting hijacked connection or strange packet retransmission. Our rootkit being far from complete and far from perfect, it should be relatively easy to detect it. That being said, we hope it will bring to light the potential and the risk of such an EDPF-based rootkit while presenting some interesting technique. The code of both the rootkit and the monitor is available at these addresses. Please have a look. Thanks for your attention and have a great conference.